handed to Lebanon's prime minister. He knows how to keep his audience in suspense. Two weeks ago, after uh, Saad Hariri stunned everyone by announcing from Saudi Arabia that he was quitting, well, he's finally returned home to tender his resignation to the country's president. Only, well, he didn't. Instead, he agreed to suspend that offer of resignation. It's still unclear if Hariri really wants to quit. For now, he's agreed to pursue consultations with partners inside and outside of his national unity government. Uh, otherwise put, he hopes to obtain concessions from Hezbollah. Iran backed Hezbollah, who the Saudis feel have too much leverage in Lebanon. The Shia-led movement finds itself at a crucial juncture. As the defeat of ISIS nears in neighboring Syria, does Hassan Nasrallah call home his fighters who are on the ground? And what role in the region's other brutal proxy war in Yemen? As always, a part of Lebanon's fate depends on outside players like the Saudis and the Iranians, but also there's mediators like France and Russia. Is a grand bargain afoot? Or is the region again at the edge of a new kind of precipice? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the hard bargaining over Lebanon. And joining us, Michael Young, editor of the Diwan blog. Did I pronounce that correctly? The Diwan blog, there you go. Vera El Khouri Lakey, who teaches law at the Sorbonne, former diplomat, thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. And it's always a pleasure to say hello uh, from Beirut to journalist Carol Malouf Katab. Thank you for being with us. Hello. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24 debate. For the past 18 days, Lebanon's been holding its breath with accusations the Saudis were sequestering Saad Hariri. Now comes a sigh of relief and the question, well, what happens next? Laurent Berstecker has more. Putting Lebanon's interests first. In a surprise reversal, Saad Hariri said he had agreed to temporarily stay on as the country's prime minister. Today I discussed my resignation with the president of the Republic, who asked me to wait before submitting it and to put it on hold in order to allow for more consultations into the reasons behind it. The comments came as Hariri returned to Lebanon for the first time since he unexpectedly said he would step down earlier this month. The embattled prime minister attended Independence Day celebrations in Beirut early on Wednesday and could be seen standing next to Michel Aoun, the country's Christian president, and Shiite parliament speaker Nabi Berri. Hariri's mysterious resignation from Riyadh had sparked a political and diplomatic crisis and fueled speculations that Saudi Arabia had orchestrated the move, a theory that took on increasing importance as Hariri continued to delay his return. Responding to an invitation by Emmanuel Macron, the Lebanese prime minister flew to Paris over the weekend and also made stops in Egypt and Cyprus before landing in Beirut on Tuesday. His arrival was celebrated in Lebanon, where he retains the support of a majority of the population. Hariri had already said he would stay on as prime minister if a deal could be struck with Iran-backed Hezbollah to keep Lebanon out of regional conflicts. His latest announcement comes as another sign that the crisis has begun to de-escalate in the tiny Middle Eastern country. Michael Young, uh, we're a little confused. Clear it up for us. Is he going to resign? Look, I think that if he took this decision today to suspend his resignation, this was, you know, something prepackaged. I mean, there must have been some kind of agreement that we don't know about, perhaps with French intervention and Egyptian intervention. It, it suggests that he will probably not um, um, resign. That has to be confirmed, but I think a mechanism out of it, it could be that the president of the Republic, Michel Aoun, will put, create a dialogue, a national dialogue forum, which Hariri would participate in, and this would come out with some kind of statement that where Hariri could point, which Hariri could point to as a success, he could, right, and so that, would, that would effectively put off his resignation. So before we do forensics on the last 18 days, let's do forensics on the last 24 hours. He leaves Paris, goes to Cairo and to Cyprus. Why those two countries before returning home? That's a good question. I'm not sure about Cyprus, but Cairo, uh, visibly, uh, it seems that there was some kind of French-Egyptian uh, understanding 
to try to essentially put off the resignation, to persuade the Saudis to uh, basically to go back on the decision to push him to resign. This is, this is what the news was suggesting in the last 48 hours. Carol Malouf, uh, you agree that uh, it looks like, and of course we don't have a crystal ball, it looks like this is all going to lead to him staying on. Uh, well, over the past 18 days, Lebanon should have been nominated for a prize in conspiracy theories, theories and theorists, because we've heard all sorts of um, uh, stories coming out. But uh, what is clear is that he has made a strong comeback today to Beirut. We have seen it both on the political and on the populist level. So politically, he was he attended the uh, Independence Day uh, celebrations in a, in a formal uh, setting as a, as a prime minister. So obviously, there is no resignation there. And uh, then he went to uh, to meet uh, the uh, the supporters of the future movement. He opened his house for the first time uh, in eight years for people. He welcomed people. He welcomed his supporters. He thanked them for their uh, loyalty. So we see that he's also made a big political populist comeback. Um, after yeah. So, the so what have the was, what have uh, the last eighteen left, days uh, been about? Recently. <laughs> Well, the, the, as I said, I, I read today, because you mentioned why he went to Cairo and Cyprus, and some of the stories that came out, it, it, it said that it had to do with the uh, upcoming uh, gas, uh, Mediterranean gas deal that uh, includes uh, Cyprus, Israel, and Lebanon, which, what is known as the Southern Corridor, and Lebanon being linked to that Southern Corridor that goes all the way from the Mediterranean to Europe via Turkey and Cyprus. And uh, they're, they're saying that Egypt could be a mediator with Israel over this. But I'm not sure. These are just speculations that we've been reading um, <coughs> here and there over social media and some papers. But nothing is, for, is, uh, is confirmed on this front. Vera al Khoury, like, uh, you agree that uh, Saad Hariri has made a comeback? Oh, definitely. From what we've seen, he's made a comeback. And I'm very happy that he suspended his uh, resignation. And three words he said are the most interesting to me. Lebanon's interest first. And I really think that it is time everybody puts Lebanon's interest first. And we have elections coming up in a few months. And we would really love to have a big debate about this, about Lebanon's neutrality and Lebanon's interest coming first. But he had um, tweeted that he'd be coming to France with his wife and kids. His wife and kids are now back in Saudi Arabia. So is it really, is he still, is he his own man or is he still Saudi Arabia's man to a certain degree? Well, he's, he said that his kids were at school in Saudi Arabia. So I'm not going to speculate on that. But I think what matters really now is what the common Lebanese want. Is it an exaggeration to suggest that he was indeed sequestered by the king of Saudi Arabia and uh, the crown prince? Well, from what I've heard from various sources, he was not happy when he was there. I mean, I don't think that this was just him waiting, wasting time in Saudi Arabia after his resignation. I mean, there was definitely something there. Yeah. I mean, he goes back to he goes back to Saudi Arabia on that uh, uh, without his aides, makes this surprise announcement of resignation in a taped broadcast. Everybody was wondering what's going on. Look, I don't think there's any doubt that the Saudis compelled him to resign. And um, now why they kept him there afterwards is open to question. Was it linked to politics? Was it linked to his companies, his, the company that he owned that was his bankrupt, Saudi Oji? There were many outstanding issues with, in terms of that company. But I don't think there anyone really seriously doubts that the Saudis forced him to resign. Uh, Carol Malouf, your thoughts on why he made that resignation announcement? Um, if we, it's important to put this in a bit in context because uh, Hariri was in uh, Saudi 48 hours before he made his uh, resignation trip. Uh, when he came back from his first trip, he 
uh, mentioned a Paris uh, international meeting supported by Saudi uh, to support Lebanon. He came back with a lot of positive uh, feedback from the Saudis, and there were no indications. I mean, we've spoken to people around him, close to him, in his close circle, and everybody seemed confident that he came back from Saudi Arabia on Thursday with a lot of um, positive feedback on the economy and the, you know, the Saudi support to Lebanon, especially with uh, uh, Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman's new policies that everybody's been talking about. And it seemed that, he, that they were uh, positive towards Lebanon. However, in the next 24 hours, he was asked to leave on his own, on his own without his entourage. And um, th that evening, he didn't meet with anybody. Uh, and as they say, he went, you know, dark or like nobody could reach him between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. The moment he announced his resignation in the very harsh uh, resignation statement that he made against Hezbollah and Iran. What we need to know is what happened between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. Because something happened in those morning hours, early morning hours, that made him uh, read this uh, very, um, you know, very strange statement. Nobody was expecting him to come up and resign, and especially with harsh words like "we're going to, you know, cut Iran's hands" and Hezbollah, uh, you know, is a terrorist organization. The, the terms came out quite strong and. And uh, this is why everybody thought that, uh, one, it was not him himself who wrote this statement, and two, there was all this uh, body language analysis about him, you know, not being comfortable, uh, not, you know, being, um, you know, not, it's not him. That, that's what, what, that, what they were saying. And then we saw the interview that came out with uh, Paula Yaoubian, the exclusive interview. Uh, a week later, it was also not very convincing. Um, he made, uh, you know, three, four points that he wanted to do a positive shock, but we really didn't understand what that term meant in positive shock. Today, he's here. He's meeting with with uh, officials. He's been to uh, uh, to meet the highest Muslim cleric in Lebanon, Mufti uh, uh, Darian earlier. He's been uh, to meet also with uh, Speaker Birri earlier. So we we want to see because he said that he's here to uh, you know to negotiate. Um, uh, the, the, the neutrality that he had proposed uh, for Lebanon in his resignation speech. So I don't know if Hezbollah or the people who are close to Hezbollah will be able to convince them uh, to meet him halfway. Um, and he said in the next 15 days, we will know if he will go through with his resignation or not, depending on the talks that he will make in the next two weeks. Yeah, and those talks can be rolled over and it can all go on for quite a bit, Vera al Khoury, like I uh, just listening to the way things have unfolded and the way they've decanted towards the end here. He, he goes on this visit, he, he goes on a, on a trip to Cairo. Uh, now, we know that President Sisi, very close to the Saudis, is he going to Cairo before returning to Beirut to drive a wedge between the Saudis and the Egyptians, or is it to placate and appease the Saudis who effectively have lost face in all of this? Well, I can't tell why he went to Cairo. I know that he's uh, close to President Sisi, and I think uh, maybe it was to uh, uh, appease uh, the Saudis. but. Uh, you know, to tell you the truth is, we might never know what happened exactly. The question is, what now? What mm. now? This is what the Lebanese care about. And honestly speaking, they don't care about the Saudis. They don't care about the Iranians. They care about their uh, and everyday these, OK, life. so let's talk about what now. These talks over the next two weeks, what are they really about? Well. I think what matters is uh, to keep uh, the prime minister uh, uh, from resigning and to keep a government that but what's can the take concession decisions. he's looking for well I'm sure he's going to uh, I'm sure Hezbollah is going to be asked for some concessions but they're going to probably be asked for some things that they were already going to do anyway like pulling out from places where they have finished what they were there to do 
Uh, this is what I suspect, but what really matters is to keep a government that te can take decisions. We can certainly not afford an institutional crisis again and a government that cannot take decisions. Michael Young, your thoughts on what happens next? Well, I think, uh, as you said, I mean, you've got 15 days to basically give Saad al-Hariri an excuse that he can go to the Saudis with so not to resign. Now, what can it and you, be? And you heard Vera there just say that the Hezbollah will make concessions they were prepared to make anyways, so it's kabuki well, it, theater, right? I don't right? think it necessarily has to be in the region. It could be concessions they make domestically, like not having Hezbollah ministers, members in the government, but having people close to the party. I mean, there are a number of options. Uh, but I think one thing to, to bear in mind is that Hezbollah today has an interest in keeping an active government in place, yeah. because a caretaker government cannot go ahead with the elections in May. In other words, if you don't have a government in place uh, now, and, you know, the big question, of course, is will the Saudis allow another Sunni to be prime minister? Or if Hariri is not prime minister, will, no, will there be no prime minister for the foreseeable future until elections? In which case you would have a caretaker government. Because the Saudis have final say on whether or not... I know that no, you, you have, have this confessional over... system, right, where it's, it's not written in the Constitution, but you have, what, a, a Christian president, a... Uh, you have a Sunni prime minister. And a Sunni prime minister. The Saudis have final say on whether or not that continues? No, but I think the Saudis, if they make a big deal of this, they could make it very difficult for a Sunni, a representative Sunni, to be prime minister. The thing is, if you have a caretaker government in place, you won't have elections in May. And I believe Hezbollah wants elections in May because according to the new electoral, electoral law, Hariri is expected to lose seats. And I think Hezbollah would like to go ahead with an election to weaken him politically. Uh, so the question is, what kind of concession it will be a symbolic concession, but what kind of symbolic concession would Hezbollah be willing to make? Uh, Carol Malouf, uh, just briefly before we go to the break, uh, we've talked about whether or not Saad Hariri will stay prime minister for the short term. Will there be elections in May? And, and, and do you agree with Michael Young on this? Uh, I disagree with Michael on the fact that Hezbollah wants a weaker Saad Hariri. On the contrary, I think uh, since this government, this coalition government came uh, together, I think it was the best thing that ever happened to Hezbollah being in government, in a coalition government with the strongest Sunni in Lebanon, because they will not have the... Um, the cover, uh, the same cover, the same Sunni cover that they, uh, if they got it from somebody else, for example, from the previous prime ministers like uh, Najib Meati or uh, Tamam Salam, somebody like Hariri with his international presence, with, you know, who he is and, and the Sunni state in Lebanon, I think it's the best scenario. And if Hariri is weakened, then, um, then the, you know, the, um, the legitimacy of, of Hezbollah or the cover, the Sunni cover, will not be as strong. And this is what they need right now. And I think this is why the, the major reason why they were holding on to, uh, to Hariri. And this is why uh, General Michel Aoun or the President Michel Aoun, uh, uh, his position was so strong in, you know, uh, in summoning, in summoning him back to. Uh... And, in summoning him back to Beirut, we're going to, have to take a very quick break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. We have a new initiative at The Observers. The Observers Take Action. Ordinary people around the world who have concrete ideas and projects to make their part of the world a better place. It could be for the environment. It could be for education or to improve the society they live in. If you know of someone in your community who's working to make a difference, let us know. Revisited. Presented by Stuart Norville. In 1941, Hitler decides to invade Russia. In Leningrad, the resistance opposes the German army. The siege lasts 900 days. Mm -hmm. 
Nearly 80 years later, the city has recovered its historic name of St. Petersburg. And on its outskirts, volunteers still search to find unburied soldiers. Today, this dark page in history has not been forgotten. Survivors tell their stories, and young children still learn about the siege of Leningrad. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com. Welcome back. Before we resume the France 24 debate, some of the stories that Laura Cillier is watching for you in the newsroom. Zimbabwe's president in waiting is back from South Africa. Emerson Manangagwa to be sworn in Friday to replace the man who ousted him as vice president just a few weeks ago. Robert Mugabe chased from power after 37 years. Manangwa saying that the voice of the people is the voice of God. Former Bosnian Serb military leader Radko Mladic to appeal his life sentence before an international court in The Hague. The butcher of uh, Bosnia, as he was known, uh, found guilty on 10 counts, including over the 1995 Srebrenica massacre. Just uh, a couple of weeks after visiting Burma, the U.S. Secretary of State ups the tone and for the first time accuses authorities there of ethnic cleansing against Rohingya Muslims. We'll tell you all about Britain's first Brexit budget. The government promises more spending on housing and health care, this despite forecasts of lower growth and a bigger deficit. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Lebanon's been keeping the world in suspense over the last 18 days, ever since uh, the prime minister suddenly announced his resignation from Saudi Arabia. And well, we've had more clarity with his return to Beirut this Wednesday and him uh, withdrawing, or shall we say the proper word terms are suspending that resignation when he sat down uh, finally with uh, the country's president, uh, Michel Aoun. We're talking uh, about it with uh, Michael Young, editor of the D1 blog. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to former diplomat uh, Vera El Khoury Lacay, who teaches at uh, the University of Paris 1, University of Paris at the Sorbonne, and uh, from Beirut, journalist uh, Carol uh, Malouf uh, Katab. Uh, Carol, uh, just before the break, uh, telling us how it's not in Hezbollah's interest. Uh, again, Carol, you were saying it's not in Hezbollah's interest to have a weaker government. Is that purely for domestic reasons? Um, for Hezbollah, Lebanon has to remain stable in order for them to uh, be able to wage all the regional wars that they have been uh, uh, taking part in. And in Arabic, we, they call it, and in Islam, in jihad, these terms, it's called Ard al-Imdad wa Ard al-Jihad, meaning the land of... Uh, support, if you want, and the land of jihad. So the land of support for Hezbollah is basically Lebanon. It's where they rest. It's where they come and see their families. It's where, you know, it's all, it's the, it's the resting area. Uh, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, uh, all the other uh, war zones that they are involved in uh, is where they, where their jihad is actually taking place. So it is in Hezbollah's best interest for the time being and for the foreseeable future to see Lebanon as quiet, as stable, and as, um, you know, not causing any headache for Hezbollah at the moment. For this reason, being in a government supported by somebody uh, who has the weight of uh, Prime Minister Saad Hariri gives them the perfect cover for a stable Lebanon. And this is where everybody started. And when Hariri resigned, everybody started talking about destabilizing Lebanon, a possible war with Israel. And suddenly, you know, the, the land started shaking under Hezbollah's uh, uh, feet. And this is what they didn't want. So uh, we saw that uh, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the secretary general of Hezbollah, came out twice in the past two weeks, uh, trying to calm things down, uh, saying that they that the, the, you know, Syria's war is almost 
almost over, that they will be uh, withdrawing from Syria, that they are not heavily involved in Yemen, that they will withdraw and come back to Lebanon. So it was clear that there was no escalation in his speech. It was clear that they do not intend to escalate the situation. And as long as the what they call the Troika, or the three leaders, the uh, President On, Speaker Berry, and uh, uh, PM Saad Hariri are in power, this would be the best scenario for Hezbollah and Hezbollah's ministers in the government, uh, in right, the so current government. And this is why they don't want to see him resign. So uh, we've had what some are describing a rare moment of national unity in Lebanon <laughs> uh, over the past couple of weeks uh, across the uh, uh, confessional and uh, sectarian spectrum. Uh, Michael Young, again, have the past two weeks have been more than anything else about Saudi Arabia? Yes, I mean, I think I, you know, what motivated the Saudis is, is still unclear. I think there were domestic motivations, the rise of Mohammed bin Salman. But what has happened, the confusion that still, you know, rests, that is, you know, that sort of envelops the situation, is that the Saudis backtracked. Apparently, the Saudis, after taking a very hard line with the Lebanese in around the time of Hariri's resignation, stepped back. Very likely this is because of, of interventions from international intervention. The United States made a very clear statement in support of Hariri. Doubtless the Europeans did, did as well. Effectively, everyone was afraid that the Saudis would destabilize Lebanon. It's paradoxical because, of course, now they're seen as the destabilizers, when in fact Hezbollah is the, is the party that took Lebanon into the regional conflict. Let, let's talk about that, those outside players, if you will. Yeah. And uh, front and center in all of this was France's president. Uh, you'll recall Emmanuel Macron going to see the crown prince uh, in, after on the tail end of a trip to the Gulf, uh, an unscheduled stopover to inquire about Riri. He's the one who brokered uh, the prime minister coming to Paris before his return home. He's been on the phone this week, on Tuesday, uh, speaking uh, with both the Israeli prime minister, who, by the way, is coming to Paris next week, and the Iranian president. Now, there's been some tense exchanges during the past 18 days over Tehran's ballistic missile program between Paris and Tehran, uh, and the postponement of Emmanuel Macron's trip to Iran playing a big part in all of this. Here's what Macron had to say. The president uh, or his office saying that uh, Macron reminded Rouhani of the need to preserve the stability and sovereignty of Lebanon and to support the Lebanese policy of disassociation from regional conflicts. Now, we have another version of this conversation on the telephone coming from Tehran. Hassan Rouhani insisting Iran has no exp expansionist designs on the region, the uh, Iranian uh, presidency sticking in a barb amongst the di diplomatic niceties there. France, in maintaining its free spirit and place it has in the region, can play can play a constructive role by proving its realism and impartiality. That's not a very nice thing to say, is it, uh, Vera Ekuri Lekai, saying France needs to prove its impartiality uh, in, in all of this. Uh, what do you make of the French mediation and, and of the sort of the responses we've seen from parties other than Saudi Arabia? Well, France has always had a role in the region and especially in Lebanon. Everybody knows about the very close relationship between France Lebanon's and a Lebanon. former protectorate. Former protectorate. And uh, the relationship remained tied and is still tied. So for me, it wasn't surprising at all to see President Macron step up and do something about what is uh, what was happening. And Saudi Arabia is a French ally. Egypt is a French ally. And uh, even the relationship with Iran is good since President Macron was planning a visit. I think all this has helped in, in uh, uh, unlocking the, the situation. And uh, I, I undoubtedly, he played a big role in finding a, a sort of a solution to this crisis. Now, let's see where it's going to take us. Yeah, let's see where it's going to take us. And it seems like the place it's taking us first right now is um, Sochi. The uh, Russian president, Vladimir Putin, hosting his Iranian and Turkish counterparts in the uh, resort, uh, the Russian resort, on Tuesday, uh, uh, on Wednesday rather, here you see them uh, just a few hours ago shaking hands. 
Uh, they've uh, sat down, the three of them. Now, ostensibly, it's not to talk about Lebanon, but to talk about neighboring Syria. And in his remarks, uh, Putin uh, has been talking a lot about the post-ISIS Syria and how it's going to all unfold. He wants a political solution. He's been also speaking with Washington on the telephone. You really get the sense that uh, things are in, in, in Lebanon maybe staying the same, but things in Syria could be moving very fast, Michael Young. Yes, that's right. I mean, at this point, the, 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 the Iranians and the Russians are sort of projecting triumphalism in the conflict. Um, and they're looking now for a political outlet. And there, the Iranians and the... Um, the Iranians, the Syrian regime, and the Russians are not necessarily all on the same wavelength. Uh, Putin's effort now is to use Sochi as sort of a passage towards a political solution. And he's careful to say he wants to do this all under United Nations auspices. Of course, they're going to... Definitely, you, you know, this is what's going to give legitimacy to the, the whole process. Um, but, um, but the thing is now, it's what will the Syrian regime accept, what will the Iranians accept in this in this process. On Tuesday, uh, we learned of a surprise three-hour sit-down in Sochi between Putin and Bashar al-Assad, the Russian president who talked of moving to the next phase in Syria with a political deal. I would really like to hear your assessment of today's situation and the prospect of the situation's development under your vision for the political process, which, as we believe, of course, in the very end, should be implemented under the auspices of the United Nations. We hope that Russia succeeds in what it has always said since the start of the crisis, which is no foreign intervention in any political process in Syria, but only to support it from the outside. Carol Malouf Khatab, as somebody who's reported from Syria, your your thoughts on what's unfolding now? Um, I I think that uh, now everybody is talking about the political solution, and it's um, it's a no brainer now that, uh, as you said, they have uh, defeated. Uh, oh, whatever, I mean, so-called ISIS. I always have this question mark around, uh, you know, ISIS. But let's say they have defeated ISIS. Now everybody's looking at a political solution. The only concern is that this political solution is not imposed on the Syrian people. We have to remember the millions of displaced, internally displaced or refugees in the neighboring countries. Will these people be able to go back uh, if a political solution was imposed by the winning side without taking into consideration uh, you know, the, the best interest of the Syrian people in general, because um, the, the people in Lebanon, and I've been speaking to a lot of refugees and asking them if they are willing to go back uh, once a political uh, settlement is in place and the fighting is over. And a lot of them uh, refuse to go back because they don't feel safe living under the same regime. And they say that nothing has changed. So uh, this is causing big question marks. And as we know, the head of the uh, uh, the, uh, the opposition negotiating team, uh, Dr. Yad Hajab, and nine of the uh, of the members of that uh, opposition negotiating coalition, uh, negotiation negotiating coalition, have resigned because uh, they refused to have uh, President Bashar Assad uh, in the in the transition phase, in the next phase. So uh, le we have to see uh, whom the uh, the opposition will be sending as a delegation does it represent the uh, aspirations of the Syrian people uh, and uh, what will come out of these talks. But if a stalemate is, happens and we are uh, still looking at the same regime with no changes, with the same constitution, I think it's going to cause a big crisis in the region, especially to a country like Turkey, who, you know, has a big refugee population on its border. It's also now controlling a no-fly zone and a lot, uh, you know, most of uh, Idlib province in Syria um, will that become the safe zone for the Syrians uh, to return to in case they don't want to go back to, uh, to regime-controlled areas? So I, I think, uh, you know, the devil is in the details, as they say, and we have to see how things will unfold uh, in the next few months. All right. We're, we're seeing those images uh, from Sochi. Uh, as that meeting's taking place, another one wrapped up earlier in Riyadh, the Syrian opposition uh, meeting in the Saudi capital, 140 different groups represented and a final communique 
uh, by the Saudis that repeats the old mantra, Assad uh, must go. Uh, Carol, you heard earlier uh, Michael Young saying when it comes to Lebanon, uh, there's been a bit of an about face by the Saudis. But when it comes to Syria, uh, again, are the Saudis the ones left out in the cold? And I guess the key to all that is which side are the Americans on when it comes to Syria? Um, I think the Americans are on, their, on the side of their own interests. Uh, I think they will wait to see how things will unfold, because we have seen over the past seven years that the Americans haven't really done much for the uh, Syrian opposition. But we know Donald um, Trump really is close to the Saudis. Well, yes, but it's been a lot of lip service and a lot of rhetoric, but we haven't really seen uh, seen it, you know, being translated. We, we still hear about, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, things to be done. We've, we've, we've heard his last speech on, on Iran, President Trump's speech on Iran. It, it, there was nothing new there except, you know, bringing back the, the old uh, U.S. Marine attacks in Lebanon. Uh, accusing Hezbollah of being behind it. We see, we, we hear that he says a lot that, you know, Iran is a state sponsor of terrorism in the region. Something needs to be done about it, but we have not seen any action taking place. Now, uh, when it comes to the Riyadh meeting for the Syrian opposition, as I, as I had said uh, earlier, the, the, the main players have, have uh, uh, resigned from their position. So unless this body really represents the 140 groups or opposition factions as, as you mentioned, um, then uh, I don't know if if they will be able to negotiate uh, in Geneva, the upcoming, uh, you know, talks in Geneva, if they will be able to neg negotiate a settlement. But uh, again, I think uh, the, the, the Russians and the Iranians uh, seem to be, you know, have, they seem to have the upper hand in those negotiations. And I think they will be able to impose more their point of view over the Saudis. The Saudis are, are, are <clears throat> not, the problem with the Saudis today is that they're not clear with what they want. It's, we, we know that they want to fight Iran. We know that they are, you know, they're trying to push for a settlement in Syria. But when you get into the details or you try to ask them more about, you know, what is the roadmap, what is the plan, what is the timeline, it doesn't seem like they have one. Uh, whereas when you speak to the Russians or the Iranians, it seems like they're very clear with what they want to do, where they're going and how about they're going, you know, to, to imp implement their plan. So this is why, uh, you know, the situation with, with uh, Saudi Arabia recently, whether it's you know, with Lebanon, mm -hmm. with Prime Minister Hariri's situation, or in Syria, or in other places, it seems to be a bit, a bit murky because it's not very clear how they want to go about with these the, policies. Not, not very clear. Let me let me bring bring pick up on that with Vera El Khoury. Like, a, so l just to recap, Saudi's doing about face on Lebanon. On, they're hosting this meeting of a weakened opposition and uh, uh, an even less representative Syrian opposition. Uh, in Riyadh, while at the same time Vladimir Putin is welcoming the presidents of, uh, uh, of Iran and Turkey. Where does that leave this 30-something crown prince who uh, came in like a bull in a china shop a few weeks back? Well, uh, in a kind of uh, murky situation, I agree w uh, with lots of things that were said by uh, Carol. It is not uh, the devil is in the details. This is not uh, a fast and easy thing, as some might think. There, the, too much has happened, and I don't think we can come back to a normal situation with the normal same people, same constitution, as if nothing has happened. So, but I I in fact. Saudi Arabia is in a difficult situation because the opposition, and this has been the problem since the beginning, we don't really know who the opposition is. Too many fractions, too divided and uh, very much weakened now. But uh, as Carol said, the issue of the displaced and refugees is also going to be a big issue in this settlement and the Syrian solution. And I think it's going to be um, much more complicated than we think. Michael Young, uh, if the Saudis f could come out of this feeling slighted and humiliated, and you don't want the world's top oil producer to feel humiliated, do you? Humiliated by what? Well, uh, 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 reversal on the diplomatic front, reversal on the battlefield, reversal when it comes to Lebanon. 
look, I mean, let's say, let, let's, uh, to be fair, they started by humiliating their political client in Lebanon. So, I mean, you know, that they backtracked, they backtracked because effectively no one wants Lebanon destabilized. Having said that, Lebanon was already to an extent destabilized by Hezbollah. But the thing is, I think we should look beyond this. The Saudis are basically frustrated by the fact that there is no real strategy to contain Iran in the region. As Karol was saying quite correctly, the United States, it's all words. It's, there is no strategy to contain Iran except rhetoric. Um, the, you know, the Iranians have made progress in Iraq, in Syria, in, uh, in Yemen. The Arab world is divided. Um, and the fact of the matter is the Saudis see that they're basically on their own when it comes to when it comes to Iran. And that's why they are overreacting. And I think they make mistakes in this overreaction. Let's talk about Iran here. Uh, the president last month stating no decision is taken in Lebanon without Iran. Yeah, look, I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Certainly, no one can deny that Hezbollah has great influence over Iran. But Lebanon is a complicated place. In other words, Hezbollah has to be careful when it does something to ensure that it that it can maintain, either intimidate or maintain a majority of the population, um, uh, you know, to make sure that they go along with it. The thing is, if I can just, there's one thing, I, this kind of rhetoric that, the, that I'm hearing, that Lebanon is Hezbollah, this is now the Israelis are making this line, is I think very dangerous because ultimately if you discredit the Lebanese state, you're actually reinforcing Hezbollah, which in many regards is an anti-state which takes advantage of the fact that the Lebanese state is discredited. And just one final point on that. Next week, the French president hosting the Israeli prime minister at a time when Israel is closing up to Saudi Arabia, or not, maybe not closing up is too strong a term, but there is certainly uh, growing closer. What are you expecting from that? I don't know. I, I mean, I think, I think the expectation that Israel is going to solve the Saudis' problem with Iran is, is unrealistic. I don't think Israel wants a war in Lebanon today. Now, precisely what Macron will t talk about with Netanyahu, I don't know. I mean, but certainly, um, you know, this, there's been a lot of speculation that the Saudis were effectively, by isolating Lebanon, giving Israel the green light to hit Hezbollah. I don't consider that today as a realistic scenario. We're going to leave it there. Michael Young, I want to thank you, though. I want to thank as well Vera el khouri and uh, Carol Malouf uh, Khattab for being with us from Beirut. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. How are you? Hi, Beth. Good, thank you. So uh, we, we heard a, a reinvigorated... Uh, Saad Hariri at the outset of our show. Yes, absolutely. And what a day to uh, make this reappearance because, of course, it is Independence Day, something yes, that's right. being reflected. Yes, that's right. Yes, absolutely. The 74th anniversary of independence from France. Uh, lots of people reflecting that, including Lebanese celebrities like Elissa. Uh, happy Independence Day, my beloved country, Lebanon. I would have never imagined myself in any other country in the world. I love you in all your beauty and despite all your craziness. And today really is probably the craziest craziest of all crazies, it has to be said. Uh, politics in Lebanon is such a theatrical performance. They are the actors and we are the audience, says this Twitter user. Um, and of course, that reappearance uh, using the rallying cry, Lebanon first, Saad Hariri really does seem to have taken on the drama of this occasion. Um, and that rally and cry, very similar, of course, to what we've heard from Donald Trump, uh, does seem to have gone down well with the crowds. Looking at um, how this has been uh, reflected in the international press, what they've made of it all, well, the Middle East Eye uh, has a long piece on this, uh, talking about the fact that the showmanship of him arriving on this very important date uh, certainly hasn't been lost on them. They say the timing could not have been better scripted. Um, they say, though, that there was, while it was a hero's welcome from some, there are others who are still very concerned about this uncertainty that he himself has really sown. A lot of people wondering, is he back for good? Is he going to quit again? Uh, and wondering what will happen next. So the Middle East Eye referring to uh, his disappearing act, rather um, sort of harsh words, I think, to describe what's happened. Um, 
Sarah Hussain is the uh, AFP correspondent who's out there at the moment and she says it seems like Hariri's return will be seen by supporters as triumphal and a way for him to regain the upper hand and by detractors as an indication the resignation was a misstep and he is reversing course. So total unity, she says, rather sarcastically. But with so many twists in this and so many different players involved, it's unsurprising really that there are... Talking about Lebanon, of course. Here. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, that there are, of course, so many different... Uh, different differences of opinion here. Um, however, one thing that most uh, publications seem to be in agreement on is the fact that most are putting down this resignation that wasn't uh, to being orchestrated by Saudi Arabia. Um, the New York Times among those tweeting uh, that this decision not to resign appears to be a setback for Saudi Arabia. Uh, however, this Twitter user, Ali uh, Shihabi, who is the executive director of the Arabia Foundation, says wrong. The Saudi objective was to highlight the fact that it may hold Lebanon responsible for Hezbollah's actions. Uh, so again, yet more disagreement. Uh, the UK's Guardian newspaper, though, went as far as to say this, that Hariri's announcement, uh, i.e. going back on his resignation, staying in place, um, suggests that Saudi Arabia's young crown prince realised he had overreached by firing Hariri. It's a very interesting use of language there from The Guardian. Uh, they say it constituted another failed move to try to counter Iran. I just want to go back to the, the, was a, the second or first tweet that you showed there about how the Lebanon, everybody, we're, we're all spectators. Because, I mean, it's true that we're talking about these the, the leaders, of the speaker, the president, the, these guys have been around for decades and they're still there. there is, is there a sense of detachment from ordinary citizens that, well, somehow we're, they're not associated with it. Well, this is what I was trying to say, is that the Lebanese today don't care anymore. The, the, the people are in a state where some are hungry, some can't send their kids to school anymore, the middle class has disappeared. They want a government that cares about social development, that cares about the education of their kids. And they don't care about all these people anymore. And this is why the next elections are so important. And I hope the government, it might be naive what I'm going to say, but they want, we really need them to depoliticize the country. They need to look at the inside and take care of their people. All right, we'll leave it there. Many thanks. I want to thank our, our Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.